Tell me who are gypsies um, and where do they come from? The technical term for gypsy is a rom, which is a Sanskrit word, which means um, man with a violin. Man so, with a violin. Man with a violin, R-O-M. And typically, uh, in the Hindustani subcontinent, gypsies had two tribes, the Lom and the Dom. And these tribes have migrated towards Europe 1,000 years ago. So there was a significant migration because of the Persian War and some of the Kshatriya, uh, you know, caste of the gypsies, the higher caste, the army caste, they have left to fight with the Persian army. And the rest of them, either they were untouchables, or they were. Some of them were from the Brahmin caste, and uh, some of them were just simply village people, like the Sindhi Romans. And uh, the Sindhi Romans. Sindhi Romans. Like uh, according to my research in Sindh, I found that the gypsies were gypsies had a kind of homeland in the desert, in the desert of Sindh, and uh, some of the. Descendants are Desert these. Of Sindh in Pakistan. Yeah, the yo the jogis, the jogis, the snake charmers. So that's one of the group of four gypsies, and they also some of them migrated back to India to Rajasthan, and that's current day Rajasthan where they have lots of gypsy tribes, and mostly their trade is music. And they're very talented musicians and dancers because that's how they survived through the centuries. And some of them were army men, and some of them were very simple people, just gatherers, you know, herb gatherers or different uh, healers, type of healers. So we can't say that there is one type of gypsy in this world. There are many types of gypsies. For example, in Hungary, there are three groups. Uh, the first one is the mostly there are one million gypsies in Hungary, approximate figures. I, I don't know exactly because even the polls don't tell that. Because most of the gypsies, they don't want to tell the gypsies and uh, there's not exact data. So the, the major group, the majority of them are Romungros. Romungro means uh, Hungarian Romas and they don't speak the gypsy language. We usually say a gypsy is someone who speaks the gypsy language. But it's not true in all cases. And the uh, second uh, major group is the Vlahi gypsies and they speak the kind of language that is similar to Punjabi and Urdu. For example, we say Churi for knife or we say um, Devla for Deva, for the God. And for example, we say Pai for Pani. So there are these similar words. And the third uh, group is called the Beash group, Beashi group, and they speak a kind of dialect which is like Romanian language. And most of them are very black, so we can say that they come from the southern India, South India. And some of the gypsies, they even they say that they originate back in Jamaica, because there are even gypsy people who look like black people. So there used to be a huge mix of gypsy groups throughout the, this thousand year history and gypsies have no written history. Uh, the biggest scholar of uh, gypsology is Ian Hancock who lives in Texas, United States. He's a university professor and one of the greatest living poets and authors of the gypsy society is Sally Ibrahim from Sofia, Bulgaria. And uh, she's done a lot of for the publicity of the Romas and a lot for the uh, helping of the poor children, education of children. And of course, it's all Open Society Institute funded, all of these projects, funded by George Soros, Hungarian Jewish businessman. And uh, we have, you know, a lot of problems with the gypsies in Europe because they face racism and this racism is due to the uh, difference of the culture, difference of the white culture, we call it gajo, uh, or in England they call it gorio, the British gypsies, and the black, the colored people. And these are two different cultures, so this is the clash of cultures actually, and they have different traditions, very similar to Pakistan, they have a very strong family system, they have a very strong brotherhood system, like Baha'i system and the relative system. And uh, they have the system which is still alive, 
in some parts of Transylvania, Romania, uh, where they have the voida, the chef of the gypsies, the boss. He's usually a wealthy man of the tribe. It's some of it's some of it is like Balochistan, the tribal system. They still have some of it in Romania, and the, you know, families marry kids at the age of eleven, which also causes problems in the international media because it's their tradition. It's a tribal tradition, and this clashes with the modern day capitalist society. So that's why all these problems uh, arise. And I know that even in Pakistan, even if they give homes to gypsies, they would not like to stay there. They would say that we want to stay in a tent in the middle of the street. And this is the same here. We give them flats, they sell every part of the flat. Because this is their nature, this is, this is their morality. And you know, like uh, possessions are not uh, so rigid as in the white culture. Possession is for everybody. Possessions are shared within the family members. And a gypsy man is, can be considered independent, a young gypsy boy, if he starts earning and getting a job and then supporting the rest of his family. Then that gypsy man is considered to be independent. And the women, most of them, they are doing like garka kam, you know, like they stay at home with the children. But some of the women are working as they need the income also. So it's a mixed culture, very mixed. And even gypsy groups, they uh, clash between each other and they don't like each other and they don't intermarry. They rather marry with the white people, you know, to get some status, you know, like marry a gori is, is a big status, marrying a blonde woman. And uh, there used to be in the past, there used to be abductions of brides and, you know, all these stories, but they don't exist anymore, I think, because we live in the modern days. And all gypsies are settled in Hungary, they're not traveling in caravans anymore, but in England they do, England and Russia, and some parts of Iran, they're still traveling. The music is very colorful. The rhythms are similar to Bairavis, uh, the rhythms are similar to Tabla, in India and, uh, and the oral bass and the uh, scales are similar to ragas and for example Bahirami scale is, is very common in gypsy music and the ornaments are very like in uh, Carnatic music it's, it's all very very ornamented and different kind of music from the rest of Europe especially Hungarian gypsy music is a very unique type of music the, I'm talking about the folk music and it is very different otherwise in each country you can recognize the gypsy music which country it is from because it incorporates elements from that country's music so Turkish gypsy music would be very similar to Turkish music or uh, Czech gypsy music would be very similar to Czech folk music but Hungarian this is the difference. Hungarian gypsy music would be completely different from Hungarian folk music and different from the rest of the Europe. It's a very, I don't know why it's a very unique type of music. Maybe it's because in, in Central Europe, in the heart of Europe, Hungary is the heart of Europe. And, and, it's, and it should be like that, that everybody finds their place. In, in, within Europe, even Gypsy, even Pakistani, even Indian, even American, everybody should have their role and their job. And, and I see it in Romania. In Romania, Gypsies and white people live together peacefully. And the Gypsies have a better status than in, in Hungary. And uh, there are not too many slums. I say that there are. And, and the drug is a problem, drug and alcohol is the biggest problem in Europe. And uh, what is the other problem is the lack of education. But the, it's, it happens for a reason. Uh, gypsy women don't let their girls go into schools because they feel that they will be harassed by white boys and uh, they would lose their virginity before marriage. So it's, it's, it's a really big taboo for a girl to go to school. But nowadays, it's, of course, it's different. We see many um, gypsy politicians in the government. We see gypsy doctors. And uh, in Brussels, also, we have a gypsy council that is also under Mr. Orban, the president. Uh, so it, it happens that the gypsy woman 
can reach a very high status of education, even with PhD, and to be sent to New York or to the uh, Brussels European Council, and, and all this can happen. But it's only a few. I'd say that, that it's not for the masses. The masses are still suffering, and we have an organization called the Tashadami Farbonto, which is a small NGO, and it's called uh, the Wall Breakers of Society. And we are trying to collect some aid for the Roma, uh, like uh, there's lots of clothes and uh, different items that they can fix things, you know. We also train them how they can fix their houses, how they can plant things in their garden in the, without chemicals, how they can grow their own healthy food, how they can become sustainable. So our organization also does that. And we also received a very generous donation from India one of the students of South India and uh, we have international press recognition by BBC and uh, American CNN journalists so it is happening slowly it's 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 not something that people usually see when they live in the city uh, they don't see the slums they don't see the villages they don't see other parts of the country uh, it's like Bihar in India it's a very poor region. We also have Haidu Bihar in Hungary, the same name, and it's also very, very poor, but not only for gypsies, for other Hungarians also, who are poor, who have not enough education, and there's not place for everyone. There's not enough EU funds, there's not enough government funds, because funds are never enough. So we, we have to do things on a survival level, on a basic level, like civilian level. Like we just talk to them, we make friends with them, we take a few things to them uh, from our own expense, at our own expense. We take a few clothes, toys, and we play with them. We, we hold different music festivals for them, children camps for them. We get the Red Cross to donate more food to them. And also we try to lead them to Budapest for some universities and for some uh, secondary schools so they can get a good education, they can learn languages and then they can get good jobs. But for that they need to leave their village because in the village, in the villages there are no jobs in Hungary. It's a myth to say that people can grow and become completely sustainable at a village. That's only possible in Hare Krishna Valley where there are so many people working for the same cause and they have lots of funds from the US and they're selling books, they are doing different activities but it's not possible in a normal Hungarian village. And definitely when the gypsies and the Hungarians are in clash and they don't talk to each other and they don't help each other and there's basically a lot of work in the village, like somebody needs to rake the grass, but uh, the gypsies are not going because they say, I'm not going because then the Hungarian person spits on me and maybe he doesn't pay me. Like, I cut all the grass and after that they say there's no money. So that's why you cannot get people for the basic physical jobs in, in the villages, like raking or cutting the branches. and. Uh, Everybody thinks that, okay, we will go to the city, get a job in an office, sit in front of the computer, and everything will be fine. I think money is not the solution for the future for these communities. Definitely, we have to design another system of survival, which is not only based on money, but also based on like, exchange of products and exchange of information, education on health, education on, on sustainability uh, because most of the houses here in Hungary are not sustainable and the eco architecture is not uh, supported by the government so much there's so many limitations because there are certain interests interests of different parties and companies which want to make money on construction and education and so be because everybody has an interest that's why the system is not sustainable it demands more money more yellow checks to pay the heating rises and the environment goes down and uh, they don't allow the gypsies to gather wood in the forest uh, where they can you know have the heating with that and then it's it's more sustainable for the environment so the laws also against the sustainable communities. I'm not only talking about gypsies, but generally 
uh, disabling people from being uh, having a higher spiritual consciousness and being sustainable and being loving to each other and supporting to each other. So the money system really, I think, doesn't work. And uh, it, it damages the environment also. But it's at the moment, it's the only way that we can survive. We, we need to have money. And it's also like we have to do so many things to end this system. But, but we cannot. I think it's, it would be a myth to be completely sustainable. But maybe in a couple of years, if the whole world has that consciousness, then, then maybe we can. Uh, but definitely, it's it's the mindset of people. It's it's bad to be poor. It's bad to be without a good car. It's bad to be without a good house. When actually, I believe that human beings are forest dwellers. They can survive. Each and every food is found in the forest. Just we don't know it. We have not knowledge of plants and herbs and mushrooms, especially, and we just produce synthetic food and. That's bad for our health. Thank you so much, Gina. Yeah. That was one of the most comprehensive <laughs> information. What's yes. your email address? Gina Rubik. Everybody can write to me with any questions. Gina Rubik at Gmail. G-I-N-A-R-U-B-I-K at gmail.com. Thank you, Gina.